Hello everyone and welcome to the first installment of my new series Through the Ages where I look at aspects of the Dungeons & Dragons or other RPGs um, and how things have changed over the course of the numerous editions, revisions, and everything else. Um, we're going to talk about some different aspects of the games from character classes to uh, spells to features, things along those, you know, rule sets, that it's pretty much open to a lot of different things that we can really do with it. Uh, but I want to start off with looking over the evolution of the different character classes um, that are available throughout uh, the Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game. Uh, starting with using the 5th edition player's handbook is sort of the, uh, the, the guidelines to go off of. So uh, any of the classes that are in there, I want to go back and look at their origins and how they've evolved throughout uh, different editions. I did discuss this in an update video that I released a few days prior to this going out, but just to reiterate, uh, I will only be discussing things that I have access to firsthand. Um, if so, for example, with the second edition AD&D, um, in particular, there are a couple of gaps um, in the different classes that I can't go into a lot of detail on because I don't have uh, the products. I will reference the fact that they do exist in some form, but I can't go into any specific details. But uh, with that in mind, we're going to take a look at the first class um, in this series, and we're going to be looking at the Barbarian. The Barbarian originally made its first appearance in the pages of Dragon Magazine back in the 1970s. However, it was also reprinted in the Unearthed Arcana book for first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, and from my understanding it's pretty much a straight reprint of the magazine version directly into this book here. So we'll just take a quick look at uh, the Barbarian that we have in first edition AD&D. So you got the just amazing artwork here. I absolutely love that depiction of the Barbarian. And you'll probably recognize this because this is most likely going to be the thumbnail for the video. Uh, barbarians back at this point in time were considered a subclass of fighter. Uh, similar to how Ranger and Paladin were also uh, subclasses. Uh, they required a strength and constitution scores of 15 minimum and a dexterity score of 14 or, or better and they couldn't possess a wisdom score any greater than 16. Um, so those were the requirements in order for you to actually take the Barbarian class. Uh, the Barbarians would roll d12 for hit dice and interestingly enough uh, back in the early days of D&D each class sort of had a name progression for um, like the different levels that they had, like uh, rogues, for example, would be like cut purse, um, you know, and then like thief or brigand or things along those lines. Uh, the level titles for the barbarian class is just simply barbarian all the way through. Uh, the D12 hit dice also stopped at eighth level, unlike most other classes that typically got hit dice up to uh, ninth level. So they did end a bit early, however, once they reached their maximum hit dice progression, they would still receive a bonus of 4 hit points at every level, which is higher than any other class at the time. They also received some extra bonuses, depending on their statistics and their equipment. So, for example, uh, they would gain a plus uh, or a bonus to their armor class of 2 steps for every point of dexterity over 14. Uh, as long as the armor worn wasn't considered to be bulky or like heavy armor. So you're looking at stuff like leather, uh, maybe maybe hide armor. Uh, so two steps for every point over 14 is pretty good. So at 15, something that gave you an armor class of 9 would give you an armor class of 7. If you had a 16, it would give you, instead of 9, it would give you an armor class of 5. So it was really easy for them to get uh, really decent armor classes at this point in time. Similar Similarly, their constitution would give them two hit points uh, bonus per point of constitution over 14. So instead of looking at what you would get from normally for the chart, which um, I think at 16, for example, you would only be getting plus one. Uh, so this one, you would get plus two hit points per hit die. If you had a 15 constitution, you'd be getting plus four hit, hit points per um, hit die. 
for a dexterity of 16 and so on and so forth. So again, even though they gain hit dice or fewer hit dice overall, they still have the greatest potential for hit points of the warrior type classes. Uh, they also have a movement rate of 15, uh, which is about three better than you would normally get since typically most races or classes would uh, have a movement of 12 or less. Uh, the Barbarian um, also has uh, some interesting uh, quirks to them in this early day of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. So they weren't exactly what we would identify as Barbarians today. They had a strong distaste uh, or distrust of magic. And in a lot of cases, they would refuse to utilize magic items, uh, drink magic potions, or even work alongside of arcane spellcasters. If you were a caster who had spells that were similar to what their tribal shamans might use, um, they would typically be okay with that, but things beyond that confined list uh, would create quite a bit of distrust for the barbarians. <clears throat> uh, they also would normally want to destroy magic items, uh, so if they destroyed an item they actually got bonus experience for it, uh, for destroying it, instead of um, just simply possessing it. Um, <clears throat> However, with their fighting skills, even though they didn't rely on magical items, they could still effectively hit creatures that required magic items to damage, even if their weapon wasn't in of itself magical. So at fourth level, the Barbarian could attack creatures that required a plus one weapon uh, to hit. Um, and then at uh, sixth level, uh, they would be able to hit a creature that required a plus two weapon to hit. At 8th uh, level, they would be able to hit something that required a plus 3 weapon or, or greater to hit. Uh, and at 10th level, they'd be able to attack something that requires a plus 4. And then finally, at 12th level, they could attack basically any creature that needed a magic item to hit because they could damage anything that required a plus 5 weapon or better. They don't gain that as a bonus to their attacks or damage, but they can take a regular mundane weapon and be able to damage something that would require some of the more powerful magic items to hurt. So it was another thing that made barbarians kind of threatening. Uh, they also had some interesting uh, abilities in terms of their uh, interaction with their natural surroundings. Uh, so, for example, some of the things that they could do is they could climb cliffs and trees, uh, similar to how a rogue would use the climb wall skill, and they would do that as a rogue of equal level. Um, if they attempted to hide in their natural surroundings, however, they could actually hide better than a rogue. They would hide using like the hide in shadow skill of a rogue that was three levels higher than the actual barbarian level that they had. So, for example, a second level barbarian could hide at the rate of a uh, fifth level um, a fifth level rogue. Um, this was sort of balanced out a little bit in terms of their hit point potential, in terms of their ability to damage uh, certain creatures by the experience point requirements in order for them to gain levels. So going back up to this chart here, um, they actually gain a second level at 6,000 hit points. So it takes them a while to get from uh, first to second level. Um, and for those who thought that the D&D &D basic rule set elves took a long, long time to level up, um, they actually had to double their experience points basically all the way through up until like sixth level. And then you get these large... Bonuses. So there were ways to sort of balance it out. Uh, another interesting ability that I actually really liked about the Barbarian um, in 1st edition AD&D is the ability to, uh, to, to see attacks or to have sort of a sixth sense when someone might be trying to sneak up on them. Uh, so at a 5% chance per level uh, of the Barbarian, anyone trying to attack the Barbarian from behind might be noticed as they're going to do this, even like thieves and assassins. Uh, would be susceptible to this um, being caught sort of thing. And what's cool about this is that if the Barbarian does um, catch you, your back attack is now treated as just a regular attack. However, the Barbarian still gets the ability to immediately attack you back. So once you attack them, uh, they can swing back at you, even if they've already made their attacks for the round. And if they haven't made their attacks for the round, this doesn't prevent them from doing so. Um, so it's sort of an early version of attacks of opportunity, uh, though slightly different. Uh, Barbarians also in first edition AD&D had the ability to detect certain types of magic, to understand illusions. 
um, and things of that nature. Uh, they also, as they gained experience and as they leveled up and went through their progression, they would start to um, begin to trust magic items just a little bit. So you can see there's a chart here for their access to certain items. So at second level, they can freely associate with clerics regardless of the spells that they utilize. At third level, they can use magic potions. At fourth level, they can use magic weapons, though again, they don't necessarily require it since they can start attacking creatures that require magic items even if it, the weapon they're using isn't magic. But it is something that they can start to use. Um, they, at 5th level, they can use magic armor. At 6th level, they can associate with magic users if necessary. Um, at 7th level, they may use miscellaneous, uh, weapon-like miscellaneous magic items. At 8th level, they can associate with magic users occasionally. Uh, and then at 9th level, they can use protection scrolls. At 10th level, they can use most magic items available to fighters. Uh, and uh, at 12th level, that's when they sort of gain their, um, again, their, their large ability to hit creatures that require like the highest magical bonus uh, weapons to damage. And the last really cool thing about the Barbarian that I want to discuss in this part of the video is the ability to summon a Barbarian Horde. So once they reach 8th level, uh, they can summon a group of Barbarians that are sort of native to the territory where the Barbarian himself is from. Um, and they, he summons, the, this barbarian summons them for the purposes of achieving a particular set goal. Uh, so it has to be something very specific that you set from the very beginning, and you have a number of weeks equal to your barbarian level in order to um, maintain the horde to achieve those goals. Um, so it's kind of neat. So they give things like uh, examples of like rescuing a princess, um, save... Uh, or serve under a good bar of the cleric in his battle against infidels. It's just the, those kinds of options that they give there. So it's it's kind of a cool ability and something that really kind of fell uh, from the, the wayside, unfortunately, because they never really gained any abilities similar to this um, in any other edition uh, that I'm aware of. So just a really cool um, set of abilities there for the first edition AD&D uh, barbarian. So um, not so much in terms of the abilities that we'd associate with them now, but certain aspects of this first edition AD&D Barbarian kind of explain some of the features that they get in later editions. So I think overall it's a really cool, uh, really cool concept. I love the backs, uh, the ability to detect back attacks, and anyone who tries to sneak up to them, if they're caught, they're sort of in trouble. And uh, the Barbarian in this version of the game, even though they took longer to level up, they were still very tanky. Um, uh, a Barbarian, for example, with, sev with a 17 constitution uh, would get their first level, they get their d12 hit points plus, um, that plus an extra 6 on top of it. So they would be pretty hardy, um, which makes them a very interesting choice. They're hard to qualify for, but if you do and you're okay with taking a while to level up, uh, it was a very interesting class. Uh, powerful in a lot of ways, but interesting nonetheless. So moving on to second edition AD&D, and the Barbarian was not part of the core group of player character classes, similar to how uh, you'd have your fighter, paladin, ranger, uh, rogue, you'd have your bard, you had a lot of classes that were available to play from the get-go, but Barbarian was not amongst them. Uh, and actually trying to find information on the Barbarian for this edition was uh, frustrating, to say the very least. Um, so the, the best information that I was able to find is that the uh, a concept similar to Barbarian were available as kits for the fighter class. Um, and one was in the Complete Fighter's Handbook, um, and another one was in the Complete Dwarf's Handbook. Uh, and then eventually, a, a kit, by the way, is sort of a set of specific abilities granted to a class to give them sort of a theme or flavor. Um, and they generally have drawbacks or disadvantages um, to sort of make up for the abilities that they gain. Uh, eventually, the Barbarian did get its own uh, complete Barbarian's Handbook. Um, but again, finding information on that wasn't easy. Um, and trying to find a description of what abilities they actually had um, it, I spent over an hour trying to, to find it and found very, very little. In fact, even the Wikipedia page for the 
Dungeons and Dragons Barbarian, which goes into some detail for the first edition versions, third, fourth, and fifth, uh, only gives a couple lines of uh, information about the second edition AD&D Barbarian, and it's basically that there was a book that came out for it, and there were uh, concepts are similar to a barbarian provided as uh, kits for either the fighter class or the dwarf race. So while I don't have the barbarian's handbook and don't know what information's in there, I do have uh, the complete book of dwarves. So we can take a look at the battle rager uh, that is found in here. Uh, so the battle rager is a fighter uh, type of barbarian, or uh, of, of dwarf I should say, once we find it here. Alright, so we have the, the Battle Rager, and essentially they get special abilities based off of um, their sort of flavor. Uh, so for example, for weapon proficiencies, they always have to be proficient in uh, Battle Axe and Warhammer. So it's one of those things that when you have your starting weapon proficiencies, you would have to choose those. Um, they don't get secondary skills of any kind. Uh, bonus non weapon proficiencies they have access to are like Endurance, Intimidation, and Singing, oddly enough. Uh, but their special benefits, their big special benefit, is the ability to go into a killing rage. Now this is a frenzy in the most um, literal sense of the word. Uh, the dwarf battle rager essentially loses their grasp on what's going on around them and just start fighting anything they can get near. Um, they will fight until all the enemies around them are no longer considered a threat. And that doesn't mean that they're just knocked out. They literally have to be killed. So a Battle Rager would probably go around uh, finishing off any unconscious enemies. So it's one thing to keep in mind there. They can attempt uh, wisdom checks in order to maintain their some semblance of composure and to prevent them from taking swings at their allies. But they are meant to be sort of a unhinged, very dangerous sort of uh, reckless warrior. Uh, the Killing Rage does give them a plus one bonus to hit. Um, it gives them plus three bonus to damage, plus ten hit points, and minus one to their armor class. It also gives them immunity to certain spells um, like fear, hypnotism, uh, charm person, and things along those lines. They also gain bonuses to saves against certain types of spells. And uh, there's a little bit of other information uh, in there as well. They can't be knocked out by a physical blow, for example, while they are uh, in this rage. Uh, the downside of the class is that once you go into this uh, killing rage, you become completely oblivious to your own physical well-being, uh, to the point where it instructs um, the dungeon master to um, take note of what their hit points were at the time that they entered the rage, and never announce to the player how much damage or hit points they have left. Um, so if you had, say, 30 hit points and you start taking, you know, like 5 here, 6, 7, 10, um, you can eventually get to the point where that character is just about to die um, and you're not supposed to let them know. So it's sort of that downside is that they fight so recklessly that they are... Um, in a lot of cases, they'll just fight until they die and not even realize that they've been wounded. So it's sort of the uh, interesting trade-off uh, there. Also, certain spells like Taunt is automatically successful against them, so they don't get a saving throw at all and will have to, you know, charge at that creature uh, that casts it. And they cannot receive the benefits of healing magic until their rage ends. So even if they're healed, they don't regain the hit points until the killing rage subsides. So just sort of some interesting um, concepts there. And that is closer to what we would come to know for the Barbarian in later editions. There's at least some semblance of there, but kind of uh, cranked up to 11 <laughs> in this particular case. So for the third edition Barbarian, they finally made their way into the player's handbook. So this was the first edition of the Dungeons & Dragons game where the Barbarian was available to play uh, right from the very uh, beginning with the very first book to come out. Uh, the Barbarian uh, once again had their d12 hit dice uh, that we've seen before. They also had good attack bonuses similar to a fighter. Um, third edition got 
did away with the sort of more specific um, situational saving throw types of like um, Rod Staff Wand or Spell or, you know, uh, Poison or Death Effects and had the Fortitude Reflex or Will saving throw system. So they had good um, Fortitude saves. The big thing with the Barbarians in 3rd edition is they had their Rage ability. And while there may have been versions of Rage, um, from 2nd edition, like the Killing Rage that we had seen just a little while ago. Um, this was the sort of the, the, the genesis of the Rage ability as we know it today. Um, so it was a temporary boost to the Barbarian's fighting abilities that would give them a plus 4 stat bonus to their strength score um, and a plus 4 bonus to their constitution score. Um, the plus 4 to their strength would give them a total of an extra plus 2 on attack rolls and damage rolls as well as for the constitution would give them a plus 2 uh, hit points per level. It also bumps up your fortitude save. Uh, they would also receive a plus two bonus to their will saves during the, the, the time that they're raged. However, due to their reckless nature, they did suffer a negative two penalty to their armor class. So there was that little bit of trade-off there. Uh, eventually, their rage at uh, 15th level, I think it is, goes up to plus six uh, for their strength and plus six for their constitution. Uh, and if I recall correctly, their uh, saving throw bonus on will saves is increased to plus three, but they still retain the, the negative two penalty to their armor class. Uh, barbarians also typically have a faster movement speed than other members of um, their race that may be of other classes, so they get a plus ten bonus to their speed. Uh, they also gained the uncanny dodge ability, uh, which in third edition had different functions. So you start off just retaining your dexterity bonus to your armor class at all times, um, and then you could get to the point where you couldn't be flanked, uh, and then eventually you would gain uh, slight bonuses to saving throws um, and armor class against uh, traps. So it was sort of a, a way of just having this sort of sixth sense for, for danger, essentially. Uh, they also gained a mild amount of damage reduction, which meant that uh, physical attacks that um, hit, that struck them, or attacks that struck them, uh, would have the total amount of damage uh, modified by whatever their damage reduction number is. Uh, it started at damage reduction 1 at 11th level, so uh, every time they got hit you would just take 1 off, so if they got hit for 10 they would only uh, take 9 of it, uh, and it would eventually go up to a total of damage reduction 4 at 20th level. Uh, the plus side with the Barbarian damage reduction is that nothing could negate it, uh, whereas uh, other forms of damage reduction, you know, if you had a silver weapon or a plus one, two, three, or higher weapon, you could bypass that uh, that reduction. This, you didn't actually have that, so you just always had um, the, the damage reduction and nothing would, would bypass it. Uh, they were also limited to the number of rages they could do per day, um, starting at only one rage per day, and then at fourth level went up to plus, uh, went up to two rages at... Uh, eighth level, it went up to three rages. At uh, twelfth level, it went up to uh, four rages. And eventually, by twentieth level, they had the ability to rage six times per day. Uh, the other downside of the rage is that it had a set duration, so it would only last for a number of rounds equal to three plus your newly modified constitution uh, modifier. So if you had, when you're raging, if your con modifier was plus five, you would be able to rage for eight rounds. Once that was over, however, you would um, become fatigued, which meant you took a negative two penalty to strength and dexterity um, until you got a bit of a rest in. Um, the other thing is that when your rage ended, your constitution score would return back to its normal number. So those extra hit points that you gain, uh, those two or three hit points per level, depending on... Uh, what level the barbarian is, uh, those all get subtracted from your current total. So it's a situation where you do need to be a little bit careful because if you're, for example, a 10th level barbarian, um, that means you're going to lose 20 hit points. So if you had, um, and death was at negative 10, so if you had 9 hit points or fewer, by the time your rage ended, you were just dead. In fact, if you had 10 hit points, 
um, or fewer when your rage ended at that level, for example, um, you would be dead. So it is a situation where it's something that could happen. I never saw it happen um, during the time that I was either a, as a player in 3rd edition or as a dungeon master, but it is a situation that could occur. Uh, the Barbarian lost a lot of the abilities to do things like hide as a, as a thief of you know three levels higher or things like that that we had um, in the first edition AD&D version. But I do see aspects of that character um, or those abilities in their skill list here. So, for example, they'd have things like uh, Handle Animal, they'd have Intuit Direction, Wilderness Lore. Um, so they had skills along those lines that sort of made sense. They even had the ability to, like, ride animals. So it's just, it's something where I can sort of see those more nature-based uh, aspects of the first edition AD&D Barbarian um, sort of work their way into the third edition one. Uh, also, the back attack and sort of the this the ability to sense, um, you know, the danger um, that might be trying to sneak up on you, for example, from first edition, um, really explains things like the uncanny dodge ability here in the third edition. So, uh, with that, they, you know, they don't lose their dexterity, they, you know, can't be flanked, so thieves and assassins have to work uh, quite a bit harder in order to actually be able to damage them. In fact, you had to be a thief, um, you had to have uh, a level of four or more above the level of the Barbarian once they reached the point where um, they couldn't be flanked. So um, it's just sort of an interesting connection to um, the Barbarian of 3rd edition all the way back to the 1st edition AD&D Barbarian. So up next we have Dungeons & Dragons version 3.5. This was the revision to the 3rd edition rule set that came out uh, in 2003. So three years after 3rd edition hit the market um, came this revised version. And while there were some similarities and some differences, a lot of the classes received modifications to them. And the Barbarian was not immune to that. So we're just going to take a quick look at uh, the Barbarian abilities here for the uh, 3.5 version of the class. So uh, the first thing is that uh, the Barbarian re retains a lot of the, the abilities that they had before. However, they made them have access to some of these uh, features at a much lower level to the point where it actually felt a little bit more of a significant um, ability. Uh, for example, Uncanny Dodge was uh, separated from the trap, um, the, the, the bonuses against traps that we had in 3.0. Uh, so in 3.5, the Barbarian gets Uncanny Dodge at uh, second level, which is the ability to retain their dex bonus to their armor class at all times. And then at third level, they got a plus one bonus to their reflex saves or their armor class against traps. So instead of it being well into like 12th level or above uh, whenever they received it, um, they actually got this ability um, much, much sooner. Uh, they still got the improved Uncanny Dodge where they couldn't be flanked um, later on, but the, the breaking the trap sense its own separate ability uh, meant that they were able to start getting it a lot sooner, and the bonuses do get a little bit better. It goes all the way up to plus 6 um, at 18th level um, versus I think it was like plus 4 before. Uh, their damage reduction also uh, started to be received at a lower level than we had before. So in 3.0, their damage reduction of 1 didn't kick in until 11th level. Uh, here they get it at 7th level, and the damage reduction goes up to a total of 5 instead of, instead of 4. Uh, the other major abilities that they got were improvements to their Rage uh, ability. So the basic version of Rage and the number of Rages per day remain pretty much the same. Um, however, they ended up getting three different versions of Rage instead of just a second improved version uh, that they received initially at 15th level. So at first level they get the regular Rage, which gives them uh, the plus uh, four to strength, plus four to constitution, the plus uh, two bonus to uh, will saving throws, and the minus two to armor class. Um, they got their greater rage at 10th uh, level, uh, it looks like. Oh no, sorry, they get their greater rage at 11th level. 
um, instead of 15th. So that gives them plus 6 instead of plus 4. Uh, the will save goes up to plus 3 instead of um, plus 2, and the armor class bonus uh, always stays the same at negative 2. But then at 20th level, they get Mighty Rage, which increases their strength and con by a total of 8. Um, so that'd be like a plus 4 bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls, and it would be a total of uh, 4 hit points per level. So a 20th level Barbarian, when they fly into a Rage, would be getting an extra 80 hit points um, that they would get. It also means that they would lose an extra 80 hit points once that Rage is over, because it still functioned the same way. It was an increase to the stat and not temporary hit points. Other than that, uh, the class did remain uh, pretty much the same. The skill list is very similar, although they may have received a few more skill points per level than they had in the third edition version. But the biggest uh, takeaway for the 3.5 Barbarian was that um, a lot of their abilities were received at earlier levels than they were before, and the benefits started to get a little bit higher as they progressed than it would have in the previous edition. So now we move on to 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons, and this is a major departure for the way that the class was structured in pretty much all the previous editions. 4th edition was a very large leap forward in terms of the design concepts that the classes had. So they didn't quite have like the chart of uh, progression that we would have before. Um, their abilities were similar to all the other classes' abilities in that they'd have um, at-will powers they could use an unlimited number of times per day, encounter powers they could use once uh, per fight, or more depending on, you know, uh, on the individual ability itself. And then they'd have very powerful daily abilities that they could only use once per day, but they typically um, had a very uh, drastic uh, impact. Um, also gone in 4th edition were the concept of hit dice, and you just got a set amount of hit points that you began with at first level, um, and you would add your constitution score, not the modifier, you would add the entire score at first level, um, and then each time you gained a level you would just add the number of hit points granted by the class. So you didn't use your con modifier for anything um, other than certain defenses or certain abilities, but for your hit points it was your constitution score plus your starting value plus X number uh, per level. So we'll take a quick look at the Barbarian here. I'm not going to go through all of their abilities because this is a 30 level progression, uh, but I'll just sort of give you an idea of how the class works. So for starters, they gain uh, 15 hit points plus their con score at first level, which makes it the highest um, hit point total once again. So they still sort of always retained that aspect of the uh, of the class. Um, and then they got uh, certain abilities like Barbarian Agility, which allows them to wear, uh, if they're not wearing heavy armor, they gain a bonus to their armor class, which starts at plus one but whenever they enter each new tier, um, it, it goes up by an extra one. So at first level, uh, first through 10th level, it's a plus one bonus to armor class and reflex defense. Um, and then once you gain the Paragon, pa or get Paragon uh, tier from 11th level to 20th level, you get plus two. And then when you reach the epic tier, 21st level and above, uh, the bonus would increase to plus Three. Uh, they also gained the ability called Feral Might, which gave them an option between two different uh, abilities. So there was Rage, Blood, Vigor, or Thaneborn Triumph. Um, and these uh, created sort of a sense of um, the theme of the character, so to speak. So with the Rage, Blood, Vigor, um, you gained the ability called Swift Charge. Um, and in addition, if you reduced an enemy to zero hit points, uh, you gain temporary hit points equal to your constitution modifier. Uh, and then once you reach 11th level, it's 5 plus your con modifier. And once you reach 21st level, it's 10 plus your con modifier. So they didn't have the, the rage ability that we saw before. Uh, they didn't have the increases to their hit points through uh, pumping up their constitution score. But the barbarians did have access to abilities that would grant them temporary hit points, meaning that once they got out of combat or if their rage situation ended, um, they wouldn't just have to subtract all those hit points. They get used first before anything, um, and they can't affect your actual hit point total. So if you had, say, eight temporary hit points, and by the time the combat ended, you 
still had those eight, they would just disappear and your whatever actual hit points that you had uh, would still be there. So if you only had one hit point and you lose those eight temporary, you still have the one hit point. So it's actually, in my opinion, that was an improvement over the, the Barbarian that we had before because you no longer had a situation where you could rage yourself to death, if that makes sense. Um, then the Thaneborn Triumph gives you the Roar of Triumph power. Um, and whenever you bloody an enemy, which is reducing it to half of its hit point maximum or below, uh, you, you, or sorry, your attack or your ally's next attack against that creature gains a bonus uh, modifier to the attack roll equal to your charisma modifier. Uh, they also had the Rampage ability, so once per round when you score a critical hit with a Barbarian attack power, which is all the ones that you would have later on here, um, you can make another... Um, melee basic attack or melee basic attack as a free action so you sort of got this extra swing it's kind of like cleave almost um, in earlier editions except instead of having to knock an enemy down you just have to score a critical hit and then you can kind of keep going with the momentum uh, you can attack the same creature again if you wish or you could attack someone else within reach so it didn't have to be the same target and then they had rage strike which all which they gain a fifth level and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that a little bit later so it makes a little bit more sense. So we'll take a quick look at their actual power list here. Uh, so we'll just look at the Roar of Triumph which is what they gain if they are the uh, Thane born. Uh, so it's an encounter power. It's uh, the trigger is when you attack your enemy uh, or sorry when your attack reduces an enemy to zero hit points. Um, it does a close burst five um, which targets each enemy in that burst so any enemy within five squares of you. Uh, each target takes negative two penalty to all their defenses until the end of your next turn. So that's a pretty decent ability there. Uh, and Swift Charge, uh, when you reduce your enemy to zero hit points, um, you can charge an enemy. So it gives you a free movement up to someone, and part of the charge action is making an attack roll at the end of it. So, again, just ways for the Barbarians to get uh, multiple attacks. Uh, then we have their at-will abilities. I'm not going to go into too many of these. I'll just look at Devastating Strike uh, first. Uh, and then we'll look at Howling Strike, and then we'll look at their dailies, because that's where the Barbarian Rage actually comes into the 4th edition version of the Barbarian class. So with Devastating Strike, it's an at-will ability, meaning that they can use it an unlimited number of times per day. Uh, it's a weapon attack, uh, and it requires that you're wielding a two-handed weapon. It targets one creature. You, the attack roll will be your strength uh, plus proficiency against their armor class, and if you hit, you deal one weapon dice, uh, so whatever the, the weapon die is, so probably a d10 or d12, uh, depending on the weapon that you're using, plus an additional 1d8, plus the strength modifier. Uh, and then at uh, the Paragon tier, it's, two, it's an extra 2d8, and then at your Epic tier, it's an extra 3d8 on top of just your regular weapon strike. So this makes them very powerful uh, damage dealers when it came to, uh, to, to melee attacks. Uh, it also has an effect that says until the start of your next turn, any attacker gains a plus two bonus to attack rolls against you. Uh, if you are raging, uh, attackers do not gain that bonus. So uh, essentially, you make a really powerful strike and you leave yourself somewhat vulnerable to counter strike. Um, but if you're raging, that doesn't happen, and we'll get into raging in a moment. Uh, and then we'll just take a quick look at Howling Strike. Um, so this is, again, you must be wielding a two handed weapon. Not all of them uh, are that, but a lot of them are because that's sort of what the Barbarian's best at at this point in time. Uh, so this one is uh, Strength versus Armor class, and it's 1d, it's one weapon die, whatever the weapon itself is, plus 1d6 plus Strength modifier, and it says when charging you can use this power in place of a melee basic attack. If you are raging you can move two extra squares as part of that charge. So again it makes charging very very uh, favorable for a Barbarian. Because uh, you could actually combine this with um, Swift Charge, for example, so if you knock someone to zero hit points, you can charge another enemy, and then you can make a Howling Strike uh, against them. So, uh, pretty, pretty, again, pretty just nice um, synergy with their, the abilities that they gain. And, uh, and they hit like a truck. <laughs> uh, but we're going to look now at their daily powers, because their encounter powers are essentially just more powerful attacks than their daily, um, or than their at will. Um, but not as powerful as the daily ones. Now your daily abilities, uh, your attacks, is where the Barbarian Rage comes from. So all of these daily attacks um, have the Rage keyword to them. 
and after the attack is resolved, um, there is an effect that occurs afterwards um, which has you entering into a rage. Uh, the rage effect will last until the end of the encounter or until you use another rage power, at which point you would take the effect of the newer power over the one that you initially had. Um, though there is sort of a way around that, and we'll, we'll touch on that uh, very momentarily. So we're just going to look at the Blood Hunt Rage here. We're not going to go through all of them, because again, there's a ton of these. Uh, but it says, your rage surges up from the depths of your pain to bring pain to the wounded. Uh, so it's a daily ability, it is a rage ability, and it is a weapon attack. Um, strength versus armor class, and if you hit, it does three of your weapon dice. Um, so if you're rolling a d10, for example, it would be 3d10 plus your strength modifier. Uh, and even if you miss, you still do half of the damage. So you would still roll all those dice and just divide it by two, even if you miss the attack. Meaning that this ability is never wasted. And then you go into your rage effect. So it says here, you enter the rage of the blood hunt. Until the rage ends, you gain a bonus to melee damage rolls equal to your constitution modifier if either you or your target is bloodied. Uh, so, again, just a, uh, a, a pretty cool ability there. Um, then we have some other ones. We'll just take a look at Mace Tail's Rage. Um, this one, it's a strength attack versus reflex. So you're actually targeting, you're making this big uh, arcing swing. Um, and it's actually a close burst. So it's uh, everyone within one square of you, you actually target them. So it's not just a single target like we had with the Blood Hunt and Rage. Um, and if you hit, um, the, everyone that you hit takes one weapon die plus your strength modifier and you knock, knock them prone. Again, half damage on a miss. And then the Rage effect here is you enter the Rage of the Mace Tail Behemoth until your Rage ends. Whenever you hit, you gain temporary hit points equal to your Strength modifier. So again, a an outlet for Barbarians to get extra hit points um, from, you know, from Raging or from Downing opponents. Um, instead of it being through, like, an increase of their a physical ability score, it's just temporary hit points that um, can go away and they don't run the risk of dying uh, when the rage ends and, you know, the hit points disappear. So, I, that's, it, that is an aspect of the class that I do really like. Um, I also started to understand Rage Strike a lot more once I started reading uh, these abilities in more detail. So, Rage Strike is an ability that they get at 5th level. And essentially, the way you would want to use this is you have to be raging, and you have one unused, at least one unused, Barbarian Rage Power. Um, this is a single target attack, strength versus armor class, um, and then you have to expend your remaining, or one of your remaining, unused um, Rage at or daily powers. Um, however, uh, the benefit is, uh, depending on the level of the Rage ability that you use, you would deal um, the amount of damage specified here. So if you expend a first level rage uh, daily power, you would do three weapon dice plus your strength modifier if you hit. At fifth level it would be four, so on and so forth. Uh, and half damage on a miss. And this is something you can actually use twice per day. It doesn't have to be just once per day unlike most uh, daily power. So that's where it specifies the amount of times that you can use it. The benefit of this is it allows you to do major swings uh, for a lot of damage using your rage powers without having to drop the rage effect that you currently have. So for example, if you like the uh, the, the Mace Tail's rage, for example, you like the every time you hit, you gain temporary hit points equal to your strength modifier, um, but you have a, say, a fifth level rage power that you just want to expend, um, but still keep the effect of the Mace Tail's Rage, you use this version and you can do an attack for four weapon dice. Uh, also with this, most of these um, abilities here, most of these damage scores, are, are higher than what you would get for the uh, ability that you're sacrificing. Um, so um, that is something also to keep in mind, and if you, again, if you like your Rage effect, then you want to keep it, you can still sacrifice other unused Rage daily powers to hit super hard. So that's the 4th edition Barbarian. Like I said, it's quite a bit different than what we had before, um, but there's a lot of aspects of the class that I actually really like. I, I like the ability or the idea that the rage uh, or that the, the daily attack that you use and the description of it and the flavor of that attack dictates what your Barbarian Rage ability is. Um, I also like the focus on temporary hit points over a Constitution score increase. I think that that works a lot better overall. 
And uh, I just, I, I actually really like uh, the class. So I think they did some really cool uh, concepts with the fourth edition Barbarian here. And finally, we have the current version, the fifth edition Barbarian. So this is the most recent version of the class. Uh, this is for the fifth edition uh, version of the Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game that came out uh, back in 2014. So we'll just have a quick look here at the Barbarian class. Uh, we're not going to go over again every single ability that it gets. Um, but we'll go over the sort of the major or important ones. <coughs> First of all, with 5th edition, we are back to having a hit dice system. So they are back to rolling their d12 for hit dice, and you're back to adding your constitution modifier every level versus just your con score once, and when your con score increases, you just increase your hit point total by that amount. So this is back to using the modifier. Um, however, in 5th edition, when you gain a level, you could take a set value of hit points versus rolling the die. And with 5th edition, you always get the average roll plus one uh, sort of thing. So with a d12, the average would be like 6.5, so instead of rounding down, it rounds up. So you could actually just take seven hit points, which means the idea of rolling hit points is really kind of a risk because you're more likely to roll a lower number than a higher one. And that's the same for all the classes, but I just thought it was sort of an interesting uh, choice that they had there. Uh, barbarians are proficient with light armor, medium armor, and shields. Uh, simple weapons, martial weapons, and um, their your saving throws in... 5th uh, edition are based off of your, each of your attributes, so they are good at like strength and constitution uh, saving throws. Uh, the interesting thing about the Barbarian is that uh, even though they are proficient in medium and light armor, um, they have an ability called Unarmored Defense, which gives them uh, the ability to add their Constitution's modifier to their dex modifier plus 10 to determine their armor class. So if you have a good dex and a good con, uh, it's actually better to not wear armor. Uh, you can still use a shield to get an increase to your armor class as well, so that, does, that isn't affected, the shield doesn't affect anything. Uh, but it is kind of interesting that they have these proficiencies, but they have an ability that if they take advantage of those proficiencies, then they don't gain the benefit of the ability. So that's it's always sort of been a design feature that I've never really liked, and other classes in D&D have done that in the past as well. It's just sort of, again, it just doesn't quite uh, work for me, but it's the Unarmored Defense is a, good, is a good ability. I like the idea of it, and it sort of fits the depiction of a lot of barbarians in, like, uh, writing, like in novels or stories for, like, the, the official... You know, D and D world. So uh, overall, I do like the ability. I just don't know why you give them armor proficiencies and then penalize them by not allowing them to use one of their class features if they wear that armor. But anyway, let's not get off on that tangent. Uh, the Barbarian Rage ability has returned. Uh, with the Barbarian Rage, you have a set number of day or times per day that you can use the Rage, starting at 2 instead of 1, which is an improvement over the 3rd edition Barbarian. Uh, but it still caps at 6, uh, which we had even with 3rd edition. Uh, so the Rage in this version of the game lasts for up to 1 minute, um, but it also ends uh, if you get knocked unconscious. Uh, when you're raging, you gain a uh, advantage on any strength checks uh, or saving throws. Uh, when you make a weapon attack using your strength, you gain a bonus to the damage roll, and that increases as you gain level. So instead of increasing the amount of strength that they have, you just deal bonus damage, which starts at plus two and only goes up to plus four. Um, so it's not. It's never really a huge increase um, from what they had before. It is in line, again, with the 3rd edition version of the class, where they could eventually get like a plus 8 to their strength, which would give them a modifier of plus 4 uh, for the damage. Uh, but it is another one of those uh, you know, aspects of the chart here, if you look, that the numbers don't really change a whole lot uh, when you're going through uh, the leveling, leveling process. Um, they, at second level, they, oh, sorry, uh, more about the rage, um, they also gain, uh, resistance to physical damage. So this replaces, um, an increased your constitution, uh, like we had in third edition. It also replaces temporary hit points, uh, because now you just half the damage that you take, uh, whenever you're attacked, uh, with a physical weapon attack. 
The problem is, is that it doesn't apply to spells or magical effects. It, reply, it applies only to uh, bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. So if your spell did piercing, bludgeoning, or slashing, then that might, you know, be reduced. Uh, but if you're taking, like, fire or lightning or anything like that, um, it's not. Your resistance doesn't apply at all. Uh, which is a situation where the temporary hit points still worked a little bit better, in my opinion. Because the hit points d didn't care what the damage was that they were, um, you know, being taken up by. Um, so it, it's, a, again, a, a bit of a trade-off there, but it sort of makes uh, sense for the way that they want to design the class here. Um, at second level, they gain Reckless Attack, which means that um, they can uh, essentially attack with advantage, meaning they roll 2d20 and take the better number uh, when, they, uh, dis when they make their, their melee attack rolls. However, they also grant advantage in return, so that's something that you do need to be. It's a risk-reward uh, sort of uh, thing there, but overall I think that's a pretty decent ability. At second level they gain Danger Sense, which again makes sense for going back even to the first edition AD&D Barbarian, so I don't mind that. Uh, it says uh, you have advantage on dexterity saving throws against effects that you can see, such as traps and spells. Uh, to gain this benefit you can't be blinded, deafened, or incapacitated. Uh, I would say that if someone's hidden and they're able to cast a spell without you noticing, that you wouldn't get that benefit. But it's a situational thing, but it does make sense even going back all the way to first edition AD and D. At third level, they gain Primal Paths, which is kind of like um, uh, a focus for the Barbarian class. I'm not going to go into those here, um, but they have like the ability to be like a Berserker um, or more. Um, based off of like totems, so like animal spirits uh, kind of idea. And that's something that existed with, um, in 4th edition, their Paragon Paths were very similar um, to that. And in 3rd edition, you had some prestige classes that uh, were available to uh, the Barbarian. Um, they do get one extra attack uh, at 5th level, but unlike the 3rd edition Barbarian, um, or unlike the other AD&D versions of uh, the Barbarian, like 1st edition or whatever they had in 2nd, uh, they never gain more than that one extra attack, so they don't gain the amount of attacks that a fighter would. It's sort of a way to make the fighter uh, feel special. Uh, the Berserker, even though I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, they can enter a frenzy where they do get an extra attack that they can make each round. So there are some ways to get that third attack in. Um, but that's just, they're, they're sort of capped at that one extra normally. At 5th level, they get um, plus 10 to their speed, but it's another ability that only applies if they're not wearing armor. So if they're wearing light armor even, uh, they still don't gain the benefit of that, which again, kind of irks me because they have proficiencies in light and medium armor. Uh, Feral Instinct at 7th level, their instincts are honed that you have advantage on initiative rolls, which again makes sense. Additionally, if you are surprised at the beginning of combat and aren't incapacitated, you can act normally on your first turn, but only if you enter a rage before doing anything else that turn. Uh, then at 9th level, they get an uh, ability called Brutal Critical, which allows them to roll an extra weapon die. Um, and it is important to know that it is only one dice, so if your weapon does two dice worth of damage, you'd only roll one extra one. Um, but that does change. At, at 13th level, you roll two dice instead of one. Uh, and at uh, 70th level, you roll three dice instead of one. So if you're using, for example, a uh, Great Axe, you would roll, uh, at 70th level, you'd be rolling 3d12 on the attack. So still pretty decent, uh, but if you're using like a greatsword, which I think was 2d6, um, you would only roll 3d6 until you get to 13th level, when you can do 4d6, and then you would roll 5d6 total at 17th level, 2 for the weapon, and then 3 bonus die uh, based off of your ability here. At 11th level, you get Relentless Rage, uh, so you can rage and keep fighting even if you drop to zero hit points. Um, while you're raging, you don't die outright. Uh, you make a DC 10 Constitution saving throw, and if you succeed, you uh, drop to one hit point instead. Each time you use this feature, the, in the DC increases by 5, um, so it does get tougher to stay in the fight. Uh, at 50th level, you get Persistent Rage, uh, so your rage is so fierce that it ends early only if you fall unconscious or choose to end it. Uh, then at 18th level you get Indomitable Rage, um, so if your strength, or if your total for a strength check is less than your strength score, you use the score instead. 
and at 20th level they get Primal Champion, which allows them to increase their strength and constitution scores by 4, kind of a throwback to the 3rd edition Barbarian Rage, and is one of the few classes in 5th edition D&D that can actually increase any of their ability scores beyond the hard cap for 20. So there you have the history of the Barbarian class throughout the various editions of the Dungeons & Dragons game. I have to say this has been a really interesting video to work on and it's something that I always find fascinating to see how early design concepts work their way into later versions of the game. Uh, for example, things like the Barbarian's Danger Sense um, or their Uncanny Dodge ability, I should say, in 3rd edition, um, it actually makes sense when you look at their uh, ability to detect back attacks um, in 1st edition. So it's just sort of a nice sort of cohesive way of uh, sort of keeping similar concepts of the class going throughout various uh, versions of the D&D game. Overall, uh, the Barbarian was actually one of the first classes that I played um, or one of the first characters that I really uh, played and enjoyed uh, when the third edition version of Dungeons and Dragons came out. And if I had to th to say which version of the Barbarian is probably my favorite, um, I kind of am leaning towards either the fourth edition version, um, just because I kind of like the the unique take on it um, with the rage powers and things like that or going all the way back to the original 1st edition AD&D version. And I would probably give the nod actually to that 1st edition version. I just think it's such a uh, such a cool class. I love the the ability to detect like the back attacks and have the sort of the abilities to um, have advantages to being in your familiar terrain type. Um, the, the D12 hit dice back then was a big deal, and all the bonus hit points that they get was uh, also a very big deal. So overall, I really like the class um, as it's progressed. Um, I would have to say that I probably like the 5th edition version the least, mainly because a lot of its abilities just feel underwhelming or at odds with what the class is given. Um, I've said it a few times, so I don't really want to beat the dead horse too much, but I've never been a fan of classes that have abilities that rely on them not using equipment that they're supposed to be proficient with. I just think that that's always um, just bad design, in my opinion. Um, if you're going to give them the ability to add their constitution score um, to their armor class, find a way to do it while letting them wear at least some form of armor or don't give them the armor proficiencies to begin with. Um, the same thing goes for their fast speed, their, their plus 10 uh, bonus to their speed. Um, why give them this ability that they can't use if they take advantage of proficiencies that they're granted from the very beginning of the game, which means that they are supposed to have trained in those things and should be familiar and comfortable with them. Now, again, maybe having them um, be able to add their con modifier on top of wearing medium armor is a bit overpowered, but maybe have it so they can choose their con or their dex um, to armor class if they're wearing armor. There's just got to be ways to sort of work around it. Uh, also, I have to say that the bonus damage to rage feels a little underwhelming um, overall, um, considering that other classes get much more powerful melee attacks that they can do. So, you know, only having improvement of plus four overall does, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, and the, the way that the progression of it also isn't something that I'm a huge fan of. I would honestly just rather let them add their proficiency bonus um, to their damage rolls instead of the, 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 the bonus third the way that they have it, because they would at least gain some of those earlier, um, and they would gain that, like, plus six, uh, I think, a little bit earlier. But I think there's just ways to sort of work around that. So, honestly, as much as I love 5th edition, the Barbarian in 5th edition is probably my least favorite overall. And like I said, I, I have to give the nod, I think, to the 1st edition version of the Barbarian, just because of how different it was for that edition in terms of its distrust of magic items, which is something that I kind of appreciate um, uh, myself. So I just really kind of like that version of it. But let me know in the comments below, what is your favorite version of the Barbarian? What, what versions of the Barbarian have you tried? Um, did you play the Barbarian out of 
Dragon magazine before even Unearthed Arcana existed, um, or just what versions did you prefer along the way? And if you know what the second edition Barbarian, uh, what abilities they had, I would love to know that because it was very difficult to find any solid information about it. Um, there was a little bit of stuff that was listed in like some responses to forum posts, but honestly, without actually showing sources for that information, I'm pretty hesitant to, to trust blindly what people said there. And even then, there wasn't a lot of information to go off of. So if you're someone that has that information, I would love to know it. Uh, but yeah, so let me know which version of the Barbarian is your favorite, which one was the first one you ever tried, um, and what are your thoughts on the current version, and you know what changes would you like to see made um, to any of the Barbarian types over the course of D&D's history. So I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope you enjoyed this first entry into this Through the Ages series. I had a lot of fun researching it, a lot of fun reading up on the various uh, iterations of the Barbarian, and I can't wait to do this for all of the standard classes based out of this player's handbook right here, the fifth edition one, we're going to be looking at all of the the, the various barbar or the various classes throughout the different editions of Dungeons and Dragons for all the classes that are in there. Also, um, in a few days' time or within like the next week or so, I'm going to be doing a companion video to this one, uh, which will be a look at the Barbarian as it's evolved throughout different versions of the Pathfinder role-playing game, um, which would be uh, the ones that I have access to, which is the first edition core rulebook, uh, the third, uh, the second edition playtest book, and then the finalized second edition rule set. So that's something that should be coming out in uh, the next few days as well. So again, hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you enjoy this series as much as I enjoy working on it, and uh, I will see you guys next time. Take care.